Well, today I just thought I would do a topic called, Can We Talk? And periodically, I think I did one last winter, and it felt like it was time to do another installment right now. Because one thing that Stuart and I try to do on this channel is be realistic. I, I don't want to be so Pollyannish that I don't recognize and acknowledge how difficult the world is right now. And, and it is very difficult. But I think there are some coping strategies that we can all employ to make life just a little bit easier. And so I thought I'd do an episode today of Can We Talk? different ways that we can cope with hard times, maybe elevate our mood a little bit, and perhaps as importantly, just not feel bad about ourselves because it is a difficult time right now. So let's just start out with, I think, what my inspiration was for this video. And that was when I was visiting with my friend Linda Lambert at her home in her garden, that beautiful lakeside garden that we did. And she, she is such a sage. And she made that comment that we may be in charge, but we are not in control. And she was talking about that in reference to ourselves um, in our role as gardeners. But isn't it so true in life that we may be, to the extent possible, in charge of our lives, but definitely we are not in control. And it takes nothing, um, really nothing of the magnitude of a pandemic or climate change or something like that to really humble us and let us know that we're not in control. But to the extent we can take charge of the little microcosm that is our life and our daily attitude and our mental framework, I think it's kind of incumbent upon us to do that to shore up our to shore up our own spirits and 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 I guess not kind of have that negative emotional contagion that we sometimes can can put out when we're around others and particularly our loved ones. So Hubs also reminded me that I probably needed to do a segment like this. So let's get started. Well, one of the things that I do for myself when I'm feeling kind of glum is I can read back over some of the lovely, lovely heartfelt comments that you guys leave. And that immediately cheers me up because it makes me feel like I'm a little bit less alone. And hopefully you feel that you too are less alone by virtue of this community and the way you comment on each other's comments. And you, in other words, I, I liked, we like to create a sense that we have each other's backs. And that's really important to me. And it's important to me also that I think that we be authentic and that that we don't, we're just not too Pollyannish. I sometimes have to take off my rose colored glasses and just acknowledge what is, what reality is, because sometimes reality bites. <laughs> um, Stuart's nodding his head. So we, so first and foremost, you know, there are the obvious, the kind of superficial things that we all can do if we have the energy to do them. And by the way, I. It, it does not escape me that sometimes if you're going through a health crisis or you're depressed or you're sad about something, you don't have the energy to make superficial changes in your surrounding to kind of boost your spirits and elevate your mood. But if you can, it helps a little bit because it helps you feel as if you've got just a tiny bit of control over that area of your life. So whether that's a bouquet of hydrangeas or it's going out and, and working that two feet by two feet square of garden that I sometimes talk about that you can go out and you may not be able to do the whole garden, but you can groom a two foot by two foot square of your garden. That can at least give you the illusion that you've got a little bit of control in an uncontrollable world. And I think that's important to sometimes if we can't have the real thing, that we give ourselves the illusion of that. And, and so I've got some coping strategies kind of along those same lines that give me, that give me a certain um, illusion and a certain 
reframe, I, it's one of my favorite words, reframe um, certain aspects of, of my life. So one thing that I wanna share with you if, you, if you are, let's say right now, you're feeling really kind of down on yourself, which I sometimes, um, I, I remember one time my, my younger brother told me he thought I was one of the, the, the most confident people he knew. And I, <laughs> I just, guffawed out loud because I thought that was so hysterical because I am no more confident than you guys are. I am riddled with insecurities that go way back to my growing up years and to my mom dying at a young age. I, I had those same kind of insecurities. Believe me, everyone you meet has their own set of insecurities. It might be a different flavor than yours, but they have their, their own set. But one thing that I sometimes try to do when I wanna feel better about myself is to go back and look back in time and say, what would my 15-year-old self, what would my 20-year-old self, what would my 25-year-old self how would they look at my life now and would they consider it a successful life? And sometimes I think, oh my gosh, uh, you know, when you're in the midst of teenage angst or when I was in my, my 20s and I thought I would never find a husband, much less have a family. And when I quit my career to start a family and I thought, oh gosh, am I, do I not have substance anymore now that I'm not a working woman? But I can look back at those points of time as benchmarks and think to myself, what would that person at that age think of myself now? And when I put it in that framework, I can reframe it and not beat up on myself so much, but think, oh my gosh, my 25 year old self would be thrilled that she finally found a husband, that she has two beautiful, successful sons. And I know these are things that we all know to be grateful for, but sometimes I take it for granted. And, and my 20 year old self would, would just be thrilled that I, um, that I had a happy family, a healthy family, that I have, have managed to create knowing nothing at the time other than only having my pitiful little acrylic ladder, ladder with houseplants that I now lived in a place that had a beautiful garden. Even though, yes, today it's 105 degrees, but I was able to create something that I, I may not be working in management anymore or in the career for which I was originally educated and trained, but nevertheless, I am now working in a context that I love with people that I love like Stuart, that, um, that we have fun 90% of the time. And who would have ever thought, you know, I remember thinking when I was, I, I still do TV periodically, but not as much as I used to. And I would think, oh, what would my 15 year old self have thought about her, her, you know, 60 plus year old self being on TV and being on QVC. She probably would have thought it was kind of comical. <laughs> so sometimes give yourself a break and think about what your undeveloped, immature self would think about your now not actualized, but more fully formed self. Even if you are in the midst of a health struggle, you know, what, what would your younger self think about someone like you now who has the grace and the equanimity and the strength of character to be going through a health crisis? I mean, you know, we've all admired those people when they're not ourselves, but sometimes we don't admire them when they are ourselves. So that is just a little bit of, of a reframe that I think can help you put things in context right now. Because as a, as a full share, this is the time of year I get most blue and I get most down in the dumps. As both my husband would tell you, my kids would tell you, Stuart would tell you, it's because I find the heat very destructive. It's hard to escape from because I can't spend the entire summer in Colorado. <laughs> 
<laughs> I've got a garden to water. I've got obligations and I can't just run away. So we've got to figure out ways that we can kind of cope. And I think this is where the, the skill and, and the, um, the importance of self-knowledge comes into play. And that is, if I know that this is my least favorite time of year and that I am likely to get down in the dumps, what can I do to make myself feel better? And why is it that I get that I get blue at this time of year? My dad always had seasonal affective disorder and he would get, he would just say, oh, I just get blah in the winter time. And it's because he couldn't get out and golf and he couldn't get out and, and really absorb all of that vitamin D. But I don't remember him generally other than on one of those inordinately nice days to get out to play golf, I don't remember him really being very proactive about it and going out and taking a walk even if it was cold outside or doing things that were cold outside so his seasonal affective disorder wasn't so bad. So if that, if you know that a time of year, whether it's the anniversary of the death of a loved one or it's, it's a time of year that's going to be pretty difficult try to take some preemptive measures to counteract that. So I, I've always wondered why, since I'm a gardener, um, why even though I love spring and I love the growing season, do I, do I start getting kind of melancholy around this time of year? And I, I finally had an aha moment. And it was when I was probably in my 30s and had children of my own that I, I kind of deconstructed some of my past without therapy, just thinking through things. And I've got, I've got a wonderful family that I can talk through some of these things with because they grew up in the same family. And for me, I think a lot of it was because I, I lost my mom when I was five and it happened in May. And so it happened at a time when we were just going into spring, we were going into summer at a time where those were really, really difficult months. And I, I sometimes get this feeling of inexplicable kind of homesickness then. And I think it was because I reflect, I was reflecting back on how I felt when I was five. Um, there were so many of us that in the short term where my, when my dad was trying to kind of get his head around things that they, they kind of sent us, divided us up and sent us out to different family members while my dad could regroup. And while that's very understandable, that increased my feelings of detachment and homesickness because then I was not only apart from my mom, I was apart from the rest of my family for the duration of a summer. And I think that really kind of infiltrated my seasonal DNA and how I feel about this time of year. But now I can, I, Stuart's nodding his head because he knows this story about me. So I, I know that now and it's particularly bad in the evenings. It's not bad during the day when I'm distracted, when I'm working, it starts setting in at about five o'clock in the afternoon because that's when I would feel my worst and my most homesick as a child would. And so now that I know, I've got a rational explanation for that, I can think, okay, what can I now do? I can't go back and change time, but I can be self-aware and recognize that as a factor, not beat myself up for why I get blue, blue at this time of year, and then do some things that can kind of, of help mitigate those bad feelings. And so recently, um, I thought, okay, I'm gonna think, I'm gonna just think outside the box. It is so hot right now. How many times have I said that? It is so hot right now. And the heat really begins to set in about three o'clock and we just want the day to come to an end. And yet in the morning, it's beautiful. And ironically, I have historically had an easier time getting up very early at five o'clock in the morning or sometimes even 4.30 in the winter than I do in the summer. Maybe it's because I'm dreading the heat ahead. But I thought, okay, I'm gonna just, okay, I'm gonna rethink this. And so this week I thought, if I don't like the nighttime, 
but I really like morning time, then what can I do to give myself more morning time and less evening time? And who cares what other people think? So recently, this week, I need to take a drink here. I've started out the week by getting up very, very early. Now that's not easy, and when I first started to do it, it was difficult. But what does that mean? Well, if I'm gonna get it very, very early, then I have to go to bed when it's very, very early. And you know what? I don't care. <laughs> If it is 7.30 and Stuart calls me and he says, what's up? And I say, I'm getting ready to go to bed. I don't care what he thinks <laughs> or anyone else for that matter, because that's not my favorite time of day. But now I get up at 4.30 or 5. I can make my coffee. I can go sit outside when the birds are out. It may still be warm even at 80 degrees, but the sun isn't bearing down. It's still cool. I've got my, my twinkle lights and my string lights on outside in the garden. There's a gentle breeze. I can do my meditation outside. I can sit there and just see the forms and the shadows of my garden before it gets really hot. And I can just enjoy the night sky as as daylight approaches. And after I spend a considerable amount of time of sitting outside, which I seldom do, um, when I was getting up later, I wouldn't have time to sit out with my coffee because it was, it was already time to water. It was already time to get in my exercise for the day. It was already time for Stuart and I to shoot because we just ran out of morning. So I gave myself permission to have more morning and less evening, which I don't like anyway. And so, Recently, this week, I have started getting up at 4.30 or 5. I don't dread it. I, yes, I have to initially get over that wanting to turn over and go back to sleep. Yeah. <laughs> go back to sleep. But once I do that and get my coffee, I am good to go. And I have gotten in a full day by 9 o'clock in the morning. Sometimes Stuart and I will now have two or three videos shot. I will have my meditation done. I'll have my makeup on. And I've got the rest of the day to tackle my office, to tackle um, I want to do some more writing, to do whatever things I want to do, including just hiding in the AC um, and hiding out from the heat. And then later in the day, hiding out from those evening hours when that melancholy begins to set in. Because why not? I may not be in control, but I can be in charge and I'm gonna be in charge of my schedule. Because believe me, in the evening hours, it's still so hot, ain't nobody out and about doing anything for the most part. And so I can just get in bed, turn my fan on, get a really good book, and if I fall asleep at eight o'clock, more power to me. Okay, that was kind of a long-winded explanation of that, but now let's move on to a couple of other coping strategies. Well, an easy way to feel better about yourself and just to put you in better spirits is to compliment somebody. Now, you wanna compliment them in a very genuine way. But last week, I, I thought, okay, I'm, gonna, I'm really going to look for things to compliment people on. And it became kind of a fun game. Not only because I hope they felt better about it, but also it became kind of fun for me. So, Stuart, I don't know if you were privy to any of these in my presence when I did this. But, but last week, I thought, okay, this week I'm going to look for really beautiful blue eyes. <laughs> I'm not just going to randomly compliment people, but I am going to look for people who have just really beautiful blue eyes and compliment them on that. I don't care how old they are, how young they are. Um, and so some of those compliments were a, a waitress who brought me my water and I took the time to really notice she had great eyes. And I said, oh my gosh, you have amazing blue eyes. They look just like my son Johnny's. And first of all, I think she was rather taken aback that I complimented her on it. Uh, but secondly, I got, I got really good service in the restaurant. But it was very genuine, and I wasn't being a Machiavellian in giving her that compliment. But nevertheless, it made me feel better. 
Likewise, I was um, waiting in line for a prescription and there was, we were kind of standing six feet apart, but when the woman passed me, she was probably in her 80s, but I noticed that she had really beautiful blue eyes. And when we, you know, I said, I, I believe it's your turn in line. And she looked at me and I said, oh my gosh, you have amazingly beautiful blue eyes. I thought she was gonna fall over. But she so appreciated it. And she just said, well, thank you. And sometimes people will say, well, you made my day. And it doesn't, sometimes I would, I would even look for dogs who might have blue eyes, but it was fun for me. It was fun for them. It was very authentic and it was very, very genuine. And it was just inspired by just something. Sometimes I will look for women who have absolutely gorgeous gray hair, or I will look for somebody whose lipstick color I just really, really like, or I will look for a kid who's got on a great superpower, uh, super, what are they called, super, character super superhero character. super thank you superhero character and and I get pleasure in looking it gives me a little it gives me like a little treasure hunt for the week and it makes those people feel um, feel better and it makes me feel better that maybe in some small measure I have made somebody else feel better because let's face it when you get a compliment don't you feel better at least momentarily, and you never know when you're when that's the only good thing that, that that happened to that person during the course of the day. And quite frankly, it may be the only good thing that happened to you in the course of the day was when you made somebody smile by giving them a compliment. Okay, so that's that's my next mood booster. Let's move on to another one. Sometimes I think it makes us feel better if we just get it out of our systems and. I know that like my husband is not a complainer and sometimes I wish he would just go ahead and complain and get it out of his system. Conversely, when I complain to him or I'm uh, really upset about something, Hubs, are you listening? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> then here is, here's the way I, I, I hope somebody can, um, absorb what I'm saying. And I learned this in talking to my elderly parents, especially um, my second mother in the latter part of her life. She was in a nursing home. She was often very, very unhappy. She was a lot of times scared. And so I found that if I approached it in kind of a, in, in, and this may sound callous and I don't mean it to, but in a formulaic way, it made her feel better. So first of all, I didn't dismiss anything that she had to say. And if I am talking to you and I'm really upset about something, whether it's the state of the world or, um, or the fact that a neighbor was mean to me, <laughs> then I don't want to be dismissed and probably you don't either. So first of all, acknowledge and give the person validation that they have a right to really be upset about that. Even if you've blown something out of proportion, even if you are having a terrible case of the imaginary horribles, just let that person vent a little bit and get it out of their system. And whether it's in the form of complaining or saying you're really upset about something, I, I, I remember my mom, when, when she was in the nursing home, even though my dad had been dead for years, she was really, really upset because she thought he was having an affair with Reba McIntyre. <laughs> and she thought that because she, she had watched a Reba McIntyre sitcom earlier in the day. Now, the fact that that was all absolutely a bunch of hooey made no difference because she was still really, really upset. Now, sometimes you could talk her down and sometimes you couldn't, but occasionally, you know, we would just say, oh, mom, that's awful. What, you know, what makes you think that? And then we could kind of talk through some things. And then I would, in the second part of my formula, I would bring it home and I would say, well, yeah, I remember once when I thought Jamie was doing something, something, something. And I would try to make it kind of funny. And she would kind of giggle a little bit because I could then put it in a 
frame of reference where, oh, that's awful for you. It was awful for me too. Maybe I was blowing it out of proportion. And then after you've listened for a sufficient amount of time, after you've expressed some empathy, empathy then try to find whatever, whatever, whatever tiny, I can't talk, whatever tiny morsel of humor you can find in it, and then add on a laughing note. And I find that this works pretty well, and my family is really good at it, and my sisters are really good at it. And I try to not only do that when I'm talking and I want somebody to respond in kind, but also when, I am, when I'm listening to someone else who might be going through a real hard time. Because the last thing we want to do is feel dismissed. I'm not going to give them permission to just go on and on and on. Eventually they have to kind of bring it home, as my husband has to eventually kind of bring me home when I'm, I am upset about something. But nevertheless, I have felt that, found that to be helpful. Um, and then lastly, this is kind of a, it's kind of a funny thing, but it's an excellent way to reframe something. I think I'm putting Stuart to sleep over right. there. <laughs> um, it's an actual, uh, it's a wonderful way to reframe something. So when I was young and I was upset about something, you may have been like me and you just lived in the pages of books. So I would live in the Bobsy Twins books, or I would live in Nancy Drew books, or later it would be uh, Charles Dickens or whatever. And I found that sometimes I, I would just look at my life as if I were a character in a book. And, and sometimes I was the main character and sometimes I was a supporting cast, but I found that then looking at my life through the, through the pages of a book lens made it seem more interesting to me. And I have never read, a, I think her name is Jan Karen um, or Jan Carone, any of the Mitford books, but she, Apparent, she does this brilliantly, and I say that because I remember one specific instance. She made her whole world, even though I knew nothing about it and had never read a book, still haven't, but I remember thinking, oh, what a charming world she lives in because she was talking about a character in her book who made a certain kind of cake. And that person was known for that certain kind of cake. And it was very traditional for that person to bring that cake to every gathering. And I thought, well, isn't that charming? Because she was, because it, it was something that was charming. And I don't know that I would have saw that as something that I didn't frame that way because it was that way in a book. So now when I am out and about, I will make a point to look at others as if they're characters in my book. And consequently, I now have friends at CVS Pharmacy. I learned their names. I learned some things about them. And now they're kind of a character in my book, a very pleasant character. Sometimes they're kind of quirky characters um, uh, in a good way or in a bad way. But it helps me put them in context because I think, oh, they're just kind of a character in my book. Stuart and I were shooting a video today, and there are people that I run into when I'm walking in the park every morning. And one of them, um, he has to push his aged doggy around in, in a little baby carrier because the little dog is so old, and I think that's so sweet, and it's very charming. And now we're on a first name basis, and we can inquire about one another. And it just, it makes me feel as if I am living in a book. I have the place that I go that are charming. I have the people that I meet, they are, they are charming. And the same is true no matter where you live. You could be living in an apartment complex. You could be living um, in a rural country town. You could be living in downtown New York City. And these are the characters in the book of your life. And if you're not going to be the main character in the book of your life, who is? So that is my last little mood elevator. You guys may have no interest in any of these, but they are some things and some tools that I have employed this week that really has put me in a little bit better mood. So there you go. I just wanted to have um, a little Can We Talk episode for you. And if any of these resonated with you, obviously let me know. And my last question of the day is, what do you do to pull yourself out of a real blue funk? 
Well, today's outfit of the day, if you've held on this long, is a different version of what I'm thinking of as my summer uniform this year, and it's a house dress. I got this online. It kind of looks like one of those Mayan or Mexican dresses. Hubs told me I look like a Mayan princess. I love the embroidery on it. This kind of dress is the perfect thing to throw over a bathing suit or when you come in from the pool or the garden and you just want something light on. And I just, I, I really like it because it's colorful and it makes me happy. Um, and again, I got this online. I probably wouldn't wear this out and about in public unless it was over a bathing suit or something. But if you did, you might want to put did like I did today and put on some white uh, stretch shorts or something like that underneath it. Uh, my earrings, I got these a million years ago from Burlington Coat Factory, and I consider big earrings, just like my mother-in-law, we consider them a signature touch of hers, and I, I think they're a signature touch of mine. And other than that, I just have on some sandals that I got from Nordstrom Rack. Not a lot of other jewelry. It's all about being simple and cool today.